we have been studying in the book of Micah, and I'm, I'm really hoping that you who have been following along have kind of wrapped your mind around the fact that this book really does represent much of what we're seeing now. I don't need to talk too much about current events. If you're reading this book, we'll say it has the absolute past realities. It had, for Micah's day, their future of what was going to happen fulfilled and what is yet to happen, future time for us. So there's so much here. We've been going through this book, I would say in a very, a little bit more generic way, but we're going to look at chapter 5 today, and I have to talk about a few things that are very important for biblical interpretation. If any of you have ever bought books, commentaries, people writing on the subject of prophecy, you know that prophecy has a wide a variety of interpretations depending on the person who is doing the interpreting, whether they believe on certain events happening. For example, there are people that have penned books that believe that there is no rapture, all right? Then there are people that believe that there will be, and I believe this, there will be a period called tribulation, the great tribulation. But there are some people that believe that certain events will happen before, during, or after the tribulation, depending on what your, your view is in, in this dispensation of time. So I'm trying to keep this a little bit more, we'll call it ambiguous for the sake of understanding the book. And perhaps in the near future, I can present something that will clarify a little bit about those beliefs. So if you have books or commentaries, you could be very clear on what the person writing, what their position is by understanding, for example, when people talk about amillennial, premillennial, those concepts that without understanding those, you might be saying, well, what happens first? What, what comes first? What events happen where? So there is at least some degree, we can say, of events that we know will happen in a certain order. But as I said, depending on those who would like to interpret things a different way. So we're going to see the same thing. If you have a Bible like mine, I'm going to address this in a minute. The Zodiades Bible has some annotations in it, and I want to talk about those, but I'll do that in the course of the message. So let me say this. I'm going to read the opening, just the opening two verses of chapter 5. And remember, there was no chapter and verse. These divisions were added much, much, much later, all right? Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. So let me stop right there. Remember I explained to you how prophecy and those prophets of that day could be speaking and there could be, we call it the law of double or even triple fulfillment, something that will happen in their time, future, and something that is yet to happen in the now, future time for us. Equally, and you'll see this, if you have a Bible like mine, there is a footnote right at the bottom. So for those of you who don't have a Bible like mine, I'm going to read it. The footnote on verses 1 and 2 say, some feel that verse 1 is a reference to the humiliation of Zedekiah by Nebuchadnezzar. But in view of the obvious reference to Messiah in verse 2, it seems that it would be more appropriate to recognize the smitten judge of Israel as the Messiah. In fact, 700 years after the book of Micah was written, it was still recognized as a prophecy of Messiah. The chief priests and scribes quoted it to Herod when they were asked where Christ was to be born. So it's kind of interesting, and you'll see this throughout this Bible. I don't want you to rely upon these necessarily. They may make sense in some ways, but there's a lot of difficulty in interpreting verse 1, and I'll tell you why. Verse 1, actually, of the fifth chapter should be attached to the fourth chapter. Remember, I said chapter and verse come much, much, much later. So you've got that 
And then you've got a strange transaction or a transition that occurs from verse 1 into verse 2. So I'm going to leave that ambiguity alone right now because there are other things I want to talk about today. But we, I think I may come back to show you the language. And the language actually is very helpful. But I'm trying to stay away from doing too much confusion in the translation right now. So let me kind of jump over to verse 2 and we'll come back. So here's what I'm going to do that sounds really weird. I'm going to start from the bottom of verse 2, where it says, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now, two things. If you remember, and I've said this before, italics in your Bible mean words added by the translators that are not in the original. That's number one. Number two, something pretty interesting here that you could deduce, I guess, when it says, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Again, if you look in the margin of the Zodiades Bible, it says the days of eternity. So we're talking about something that could not be, someone that could not be anyone else but the Lord. That verse 2 is not ambiguous whatsoever. Days of eternity, we see his existence from eternity as God. His goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. This is clear. This prophecy, as I said, can only belong to Christ. It speaks of a going forth that was now past. So it cannot be read as his goings have been as in Micah's day, as in the now. Speaking of something of old, already happened. So if you put these words together, it describes eternal, everlasting. You've got the same type of verbiage. And I'll just read it to you in case you don't want to turn there, where it says before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The same Hebrew verbiage is there. So it's very, very clear. And we have, if you put this whole book together, you've got so much in here to make it all make sense. You remember when Jesus, in the book of John, when he said, before Abraham was, I am. That tells you that he was there. He was there at the creation. I addressed this a little bit in passing already, but you begin in the book of Genesis, and you've got the Elohim, which is the Hebrew majestic plural, which is really, if you think about it, right there in the opening of the book, the Hebrew Bible tells us of the triune God. So it's kind of it's sad that a lot of our Jewish friends read what they call their book and cannot see clearly that Christ was there at the beginning, that there, were, there was more than one, even though we worship one God, the three parts of the Godhead were there in creation so clearly. This passage also marks out clearly something else. If you read on, it says here that out of thee he shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And it makes sense to me. The religious leaders in Christ's day had every argument against Christ being the Messiah so far as being ruler in Israel, that Israel ruled for him to be put to death. So if you think about it, you remember Christ's words when he said, my kingdom is not of this world in John 18. But if one reads the New Testament clearly, he was not only ruler when he came, have you ever known anyone to control the wind and the water? If somebody has control of that, they either got some funny technological techniques, which I highly doubt that existed in Christ's day, or he's the one that's in control of everything and therefore ruler, not just of this particular people, but of the whole earth. So it's kind of interesting. If you think about it, you read the New Testament, he commanded the sick to be healed. You ever heard of anybody else do that? or the dead to come out of the grave. So it, it kind of makes you scratch your head when you read the New Testament, how the religious leaders of Christ, they couldn't recognize this. It's kind of baffling if you think about it. But no one could fit this description of everlasting ruler in Israel. And what Micah foretells about Christ, and I want you to think about this, some seven or maybe even close to 800 years before the birth of Christ, but thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, 
though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth. Speaking of the nativity place of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this scripture seems very clear to me, was probably whispered in the ears of Herod at the time when you read in Matthew 2, 6 about his decree against any child, male child being born. So it seems to me, even again back into the New Testament, it was universally known. The scripture even said it, John 7, and I believe it's verse 42, where it says that out of Bethlehem, the city of David, hath not the scripture said that Christ should come out of this place. So it's still, every one of these, when you start looking, becomes one of those head scratchers. Like, did people not understand or know? Because there was no New Testament. They were reading and combing these scriptures. We're looking at ourselves. Could they not see and understand? Even if you remember when Nathaniel made that comment, can anything come out of Nazareth? You remember that? And Philip said, come and see. Even to his own, there was this kind of, huh? Like, what's so special about that? Something so insignificant. But it makes perfect sense for me. By the way, the word is, we know, Bethlehem, house of bread. And that word that's beside it, Ephrata, which means fruitful. So you've got the house of bread, fruitful. Kind of interesting that that is put there. And that's put there for a reason, by the way. People don't know this, but there were other places named Bethlehem. So it's a very clear shot. We're not being ambiguous here as to the place of the nativity of Christ. And then, of course, this little among the thousands of Judah, not considerable populace, by the way, but it had nothing noteworthy about it. We're talking about within the realm of where our Lord was born. But... I like the fact that, again, you can look at this and say, God uses the base things to confound. Because even in Christ's day, no one would have said, if, if they would have said he was born out of a, a grand place, that might have bought more with the religious people. But the fact that he came out of this little blip on a radar, insignificant, not really known for too much, well, different story. And that's really the way, I love that that's the way God does things. He takes what is usually seen in the eyes of many as irrelevant and significant base, and that's what he focuses on. That's what he chooses. You can take this same concept and say this is what Paul talked about when he said that our Lord humbled himself. Same concepts are always being repeated. This is why, and I will try and say this in a very clear way, there is for the religious people in Christ's day, there was great confusion, even though we know the nativity occurred in Bethlehem. He was referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, or they called him sometimes the Nazarene. Well, that's because he heralded from Nazareth. And in that day, not like today, sometimes people would be known by, it was very common to be known by the village you heralded from. Hence, Mary Magdalene. Magdalene is not her name. She came from Magdala. So when we refer to people in the scriptures, we have to be cognizant that people say, well, how could they have missed that Jesus was not the Jesus born in Bethlehem? Well, first of all, he came to his own and his own received him not. That's one. And number two, he was known by that time as Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of Bethlehem. So there's a lot of these interesting things. If you're not willing to sort them out, it's not going to make sense, and you're going to be awfully confused. Likewise, I should say a footnote, and forgive me for bringing this down to the lowest level, but for people who are just starting out, they get very confused about this. So how could he be from everlasting and then be born in Bethlehem? And that's very easy. We read in the Old Testament, for example, there are things like Christophanies or Theophanies. Those are appearances of God, not yet in a tent of human flesh like us. So, for example, if you go and you read the passage in Genesis 18, where it is, in my mind, it is a theophany or a Christophany that appears to Abraham on the plains of Mamre in Genesis 18, that is God. Although, just remember one thing, to see God in that day meant the people understood it as death, right? 
So I don't think that God appeared in his Shekinah glory and in his radiance to Abraham, appeared a certain way, sometimes referred to as the angel of the Lord. I'm not sure if that could make the closest bridge. I also equally believe this, the crippling of Jacob, I believe, came at the hands of, even though it's his angel of the Lord, came at the hand of a Christophany or a Theophany to reach down right there into the stream of time for a purpose. So don't be confused. God made sure that we could look on him and know he was like us or he came to be like us. And that word tented or tabernacled in flesh. So before the coming, we'll call it the birth of Christ, he, I'm sure Christ, appeared in a diversity of ways. But at a set time, God said, I'm going to reveal myself and so that people will know, they will identify. He came to the likeness like us in sinning flesh. That's what he looked like. He had no sin, but he came in the likeness of sinning flesh. So you've got all that. And then there's some interesting things as well uh, when it says among the thousands of Judah. So we've got some very clear identifying marks from our Lord and Savior, that he came from the tribe of Judah. We know that. Genesis 49, 10, that says, clearly the scepter shall not depart from Judah. That scripture, that is basically until Shiloh comes, pointing right to Christ, right to the end of the book, where in Revelation 5, 5, he is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So I love the fact that from cover to cover, there is no, there's no confusion about who he is, where he came from, how he heralded, how he presented himself, or how he will be at the end. There are some beautiful things within this, kind of historically, if you think about it. Now, this goes into people saying, this is just a collection of fabricated tales and myths, because people who don't study this book tend to have that idea, and listen, it's like anything else, you're entitled to your own opinion, but that's your opinion. When I read, for example, going back to the time of Ruth in the book of Ruth, where she went to glean in the fields of Boaz, you remember out of the book of Ruth, she went to glean in the fields of Boaz, and that ended up in the union of Ruth and Boaz making Obed that produced Jesse, that produced David. Those fields were right there in that town that is being heralded out of that small town, which becomes a very important place at the end of time. But as though God said, I'm going to make sure that you know that there was no mistake. I'm going to keep adding layers to this so that you can see the richness of this portrait is not by accident. And that from this city of David comes our Lord. So there's a lot of history there. Don't just read it and gloss over it. But what's interesting is this, when it says about a ruler in Israel whose goings forth, and then you read on to verse 3, therefore will he give them up until the time. So here's what's crazy. He will give them up for a time. When this ruler comes again, he will end the period of estrangement. Now, I do have a lot of Jewish listeners and some of them don't like when I say these things. But listen, this, this is actually within your books, not mine. I mean, I claim it all, old and new, but this is the book you read. You don't read the New Testament. And it says here, therefore he will give them up until the time. Read on that she which travaileth hath brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Be very aware of this. Just as this nation is teetering on what I've said, God lifting the hand away for a time, God also took his hand off of a group of people for a time. And it's not as though he said, I'm going to take my hand off and I'm never going to look back. Why? Because God's a man, not a man to lie. He made a promise and a covenant, and he will honor that covenant. But this is, it's very interesting. Therefore, will he give them up until the time is basically saying, if you want to understand it a little bit more clearly, go and read other prophets. Do you remember in the opening of Hosea, 
go to your brethren and say, Ami, and go to your sisters and say, Ruhama, Ami, my people, Ruhama, mercy. And then turns around and says, no, you are lo Ami, not my people, and you are lo Ruhama, no mercy, because the people were so unfaithful to God's way. This is repeated over and over and over again until you read, by the way, the last book of the Old Testament, which is Malachi, which the last line of that book does indeed end with the curse, but it says, He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. This is, is in reference to those, a kind of heads-up warning. God's got a plan, by the way, for this remnant people. And when he calls them a remnant, I probably need to do a little bit of a study on this to make this a little bit more clear. There was the remnant of those people who were carried away. Remember, there were multiple successive carryings away, if you will, between the Assyrian Empire and then, lastly, the Babylonians. But in each case, at some time, as I said, when the heathen king Cyrus decreed that they could return, it was a small number that returned back to the land. That could be called a remnant right there, which it is. Then there is a remnant, which is a more specific remnant. There's actually several different Hebrew words being used to denote that which was set aside deliberately and that which volitionally had a heart towards God in return. It's a very interesting, you can't see it in English, unfortunately, it's all the same words. But the therefore of verse 3 is a logical result of this ruler. He will be known by all as the true shepherd. And when it says... If you read down in verse 4, he shall stand and feed. It's actually he shall stand and rule. So if you have a Bible like mine, you'll see it in the margin. I said there's a lot of translation to be made, but I don't want to tackle that. So he shall stand and rule. It is the logical result of this ruler that it says the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Now, there are more things to talk about, but I want to talk about this. He shall stand and rule in the strength of the Lord. He is referred to over and over again in the New Testament as well as in the Old as shepherd. Just from the mouth and the pen of David, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, probably the best known by all, even those who don't read the Bible. But he is known in the New Testament as the true shepherd, the good shepherd. You want to talk about all the dimensions of all the ways that he shall lead, guide, feed, protect, rule. It's all right there when he says, and he shall rule in the strength of the Lord. Do not get confused. This verbiage sounds like maybe two or three different persons being referred to. But no, it is speaking of the Lord himself standing and ruling in the strength, not in the strength of a man or in human strength, but in the strength, the power, the dunamis of God, if you will, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall abide for now, shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. So let me talk a little bit about this and kind of show you some or point to some scriptures that we could apply right here and right now. There are many Old Testament prophecies and scriptures that are messianic. Psalm 21, for example, is the praise of the king. And there's no way that you could read Psalm 21 and think that it's referring to a human king based on some of the verbiage that's in there. And there are so many of these that it's very important to understand that what is being said here in direct reference to when he comes again, when he returns, and I know it's hard for people to kind of put the pieces together, but at the time that he stands to rule, in many different places it's very clear he will rule, he will be seen as the ruler, and there are consequences to those who still will have a stout heart towards acknowledging that he is indeed the Messiah. So kind of a, a little bit of interest there. Now, I'm going to do an overview, and I think I'll come back to go through these verses as needed. But 
I need to address another kind of ambiguous part of this text, and that is verse, verses 5 and 6. Because if, again, if you have a Bible like mine, and I'm going to preface this very carefully, it's not just Micah that refers to the Assyrian. The Assyrian is referred to in many different books by many different prophets. And there is a huge gap of time between the Assyrians, I think I showed you on my timetable, and the collapse or demise of the Assyrian Empire. And of course, we know the next empire that raises up is the Babylonian Empire that does all of its damage. And then they go away. Now, it won't make sense to you unless I explain it this way. By the time Zechariah is writing, it's another prophet, he uses the term Assyrian, and it's abundantly clear that at the time of his writing, the Assyrian Empire had already fallen. Okay? So we know that many times the Assyrian, or reference to the Assyrian, is either an enemy or enemy nations towards the people of God, representing evil, sometimes representing Antichrist. There is a whole degree of this, and it depends on which book you're reading. But let me read another one of these footnotes in the Zodiades Bible so you can see interpretation can be incredibly ambiguous. The footnote in the Zodiades Bible says, actually, I'm sorry, for my audience at home who may not have a Bible in front of them, let me read the passage, and then I'll read the footnote. So forgive me. It says at the end of verse 4, For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth, and this italicized man shall be the peace when the Assyrian shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land, and when he treadeth within our borders. So let me go back now and read what Zodiades commented on this to say. This passage describes Israel's vindication at the end of the tribulation. The Assyrian represents Israel's enemies during the tribulation, much as the king of the north and the king of the south take on eschatological meanings corresponding to the fact that they are actual historic figures. And King of the North, King of the South, you'd find those references, for example, in Daniel and other prophetic books. So we need to be very careful about this. There is no doubt in my mind that this may have a twofold, not, verse, not verses 3 and 4 necessarily, but verse 5 and 6 may have a double fulfillment. The only thing that I can tell you is it is undoubtedly for me future time for one reason. And no one is able, there is not one individual that is able to explain this. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. And this, historically, I don't care where you want to try and get your information from, hasn't happened. Good luck, okay? So we can talk about the Assyrian as being an enemy of the people, but I'd prefer to look at it as future time. And if you saw what I have colored for you in the first battery of messages, the orange and green, where I said unfulfilled, fulfilled. This, in my opinion, remains yet unfulfilled. At what time does it fit in? I'm not going to go there just yet. We'll, we'll have to revisit this when we're done looking at the whole picture. So let's move on here, because I do want to show you something kind of strange as well. Verses 7 and 8 have an interesting, an interesting phrase. In the remnant of Jacob... You'll see it in verse 7, and you see it again in verse 8, the remnant of Jacob. So a couple of things. Turn back to 4, 6, where it says, In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast afar off a strong nation. Very important, there is a word here being used when it says halted. That is the same word being used in other Old Testament books, specifically Genesis, to refer to lame. Lame. He's basically saying this lame group, 
I will turn into a strong group. This goes back to where I started to say God uses the small things to show his mighty power. So a remnant of Jacob, and this is very, very interesting the way this is worded, and the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as the dew, as dew from the Lord, as the shower upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor witteth for the sons of men. So let me stop and talk about that because this is a little bit wild. He's talking about a group of people. We, th we think remnant. When I think of remnant, I think of very little. Think of remnant in terms of those who never stop being faithful, but we're talking about some type of fidelity that's not just that casual wishy-washy thing we see every day. So a remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people. And here it sounds very poetic, but I want you to think of this. As dew from the Lord, as a shower upon the grass. And it's kind of weird because in Job 38, 28, there's a passage that says, Hath the rain, does the rain have a father? Or who hath begotten the drops of dew? As if to say, these are from God, they are from above. Nobody aids in it. You could say, well, it's the pressure it's the atmospheric pressure, it's this thing, it's that, but it comes from above. It's a gift from God. So when it says, the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord or showers upon the grass, I want you to think of how we are taught in the New Testament about the Spirit of God coming down. No one knows. Remember in that passage from John, you must be born from above, again from above. Same concept as dew from the Lord and dew no one can say except for the fact that dew appears at some time between the darkness and the morning light. So however you want to paint that picture. And then he says, not that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. Somehow these will be endued. This remnant of Jacob will be endued from above. Like dew is necessary to refresh, to give the moisture, especially if you think about it. This would be extremely graphic to people in a land that didn't get much rain. To have dew would be like the much needed moisture or water, but no one can say where it comes from. Talking about how these people will be in the midst of many people. So a remnant amongst many. And we can take this as a type of a way of saying Read on in verse 8, it becomes more clear. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flock of the sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces and none can deliver. So kind of interesting that this remnant of Jacob will be a refreshment to some, will be the gift from above, but it will also be this remnant amongst the nations will also be a terror. So God's saying these people will be endued for, again, a special calling, a special purpose. And it's very interesting that even the poetry, sometimes poetry in the King James can be terrible. This one is abundantly clear. Dew, rain, not that it comes from man, so something that is void of the human touch that comes from God, and likewise the power of this remnant. And think about it, have you ever seen, you know, you see, watch videos of a lion devouring a carcass. No one can rip the carcass from the lion's mouth. That's to say these people will be unstoppable. Now there, there is so much scripture that talks about these remnant people in the last days. And this is why I said to you, be very careful about who you think will be there or not. Be careful about who you think these people are. Just as I said, if you go to the book of Revelation and the 144,000 preachers of righteousness all coming, heralding from the tribes, don't automatically think, this is the mistake people think, well, these must all be Jews preaching. No, they're not. Don't, don't think that. Will there be those in the last days preaching that will be of that faith? Possibly they'll be converted to Christ. They will look upon him whom they've pierced, Zachariah says, and they shall mourn. They will realize, oops, 
My bad, right? Okay. But if you want to hear about the dew, Micah's not the only person to write about this. In Hosea 14 and 4, he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. And I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. Multiple places this picture of dew is used to say God's refreshment, much in the language that we would use of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. In fact, if you want the language abundantly clear in your own leisure, read Joel, because Joel kind of gives the same imagery and does the same thing. So it's pretty important. These people will be a blessing to those in their midst, like the dew is to a blade of grass. And think about, go back to the pictorial sense of if many people, if you could imagine many people as being hundreds of thousands of millions of blades of grass, and these will be the dew to that grass. So as I said, be very careful about what you think of these people that will be the remnant of the future. Also, as I said, beasts of the, of the forest, silent and gentle, yet overcoming their spiritual enemies. All of that is made clear. We go away from the poetry in verse 9. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. So, here's the big question. You remember we looked at, in an earlier message, I described universal peace, where it says that they'll turn their weapons, their weapons of warfare will no longer be used, and will have universal peace. This will happen, and I, again, probably should lay out the order of things, but you have to kind of see what he's saying. Thy hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, thine enemies shall be cut off. And then he goes on to say, It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord. And so from verse 10 to verse 15, there's something very interesting that happens. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. Now, none of this, if you're reading this, will really make sense unless you can imagine. Again, Micah is not writing in terms of let's write for the people who will live 2,500 years from now who have technology and don't use horses and uh, chariots anymore. This was the military might of his day. Horses and chariots are the terminology to describe military might in that day. So when he says, in that day, I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee and I will destroy thy chariots, he's talking about military might. And if you know prophecy of the future. This will all make sense eventually. But again, you've got to kind of take this as bits and pieces as you read. They shall have no carnal protection, no reliance upon their own defenses. And there is another passage, forgive me for doing this, but I like pointing these out because in your own time you can go and read them and see how Micah is not speaking in a vacuum, okay? He's not just saying this all by himself. If you turn and read in Isaiah chapter 2, he talks about this a little bit. He says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let, let us walk in the light of the Lord. But he goes on to talk about how their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. We'll read this in the next verses that I'm going to get to in Micah. That which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. And goes on to describe the, the terror of that day, but the dependence upon their false everything. It's a false confidence. In your own time, read that chapter 2, and you'll see it lines up with verses 10 through 15 of Micah 5. So... You have it again in Zechariah 9.10 where it says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. So remember, and there's plenty of places where it says they trusted in their horses and chariots and so forth. I think that's in Psalm 20. You find there's a catalog here which will make a lot of sense when you get through it. So I will destroy basically the reliance upon your military might, that which you've done with your own hands. I will cut off the cities of thy land and throw down all thy strongholds, all the places you built up to protect yourself. So not just your military might, but the walls you built to protect yourself. I'm going to tear them down. 
and I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. So hold that thought right there. Remember the opening where I said, this has not yet happened, for behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. Now you can connect the dots because the pro remember prophecies like this, it's, it's kind of, it comes and goes. You're not sure what time he's talking about. This is the time he's talking about. So bring that chapter 1, verse 3 into this dimension when the Lord comes down and you can see what's going to be destroyed. I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy hand. Thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off. Thy standing images, statues, out of the midst of thee. And thou shalt have no more worship, no more worship the work of thy hands. That is Isaiah 2. I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so I'll destroy thy cities. And he ends this whole oracle prophecy of this chapter with, and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. Now, this is what's interesting. You put this all into modern terms. Imagine how, we, we can't even fathom this, in the, eyes, in the eyes of God, what he must be looking at down here and thinking, was it not enough that I gave my only begotten son, that he died on the cross, and it's a message that's loud and clear for the ages. And yet still it's not enough. They still have to build these statuaries and they still have to bow down and venerate things. And as I've told you many times in church history, the veneration of things within the church before the Protestant Reformation. Come see the finger of John the Baptist. We have a lock of hair from Saint so-and-so and they'd get money from people and you'd have to bow down and worship at that shrine. So when it says witchcraft, soothsayers, graven images, statues. I'll pluck up thy groves. And that's a term, by the way, used for those things, the Ashrath poles and the worship of Baal and all these false deities. And don't think, oh my God, that's an Old Testament thing. You're, you're living in some old dispensation. All you got to do is go to the book of Acts chapter 19. When Paul was in Ephesus, remember, and they wanted to kill him. They were after him. Why? Because he was talking about these little statues of Diana, right, that were circulating. Just don't limit this to something in antiquity. It goes on all the day long. I'm not opposed. Listen, I, for years, wore a cross around my neck, and I have no problem. I'm not one of these people who say, oh, you should never. But I don't worship the cross. It's a symbol to me that is powerful, and it reminds me of the power, an empty cross specifically, that God could raise up our Lord and Savior, that he didn't stay dead hanging on the cross. But would I worship that? Absolutely not. And this is the tragedy of the bulk of what is called faith and worship today. It is pseudo-religion. People want to hang on to a tangible. They want to touch something. What, do you, what goes through your mind when you see people filing through the images, usually around Christmas time, filing through the churches in the Holy Land, specifically the sepulchre church where people are bowing down to kiss the rock and kiss and touch and it's like that is the same thing as what was being preached against here this is the same thing that was spoken of in exodus 20 thou shall not and listen it's not that i'm a person living by 10 commandments but abundantly clear god said you will worship me i am the one true god there's nothing else how could we be so stu stubborn and stout minded to think, well, we'll just make something with our hands. Did we not learn from Aaron building the golden calf or from, as I said, the, the images put up at Dan and Bethel that God was displeased with all of this? And yet for thousands of years now, we just keep perpetuating the same act thinking, this is wonderful. This is something I can, I need something I can touch instead of trusting the whole time like God wanted for us to trust in the living God. Take him at his word that he is who he said he is and he will do what he said he will do. So when the close of the book says, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard, I want you to think about this and let this kind of resonate for a bit. That God has never given the seal of approval for any other worship 
for any other praise, for any other type of anything, yet just solely unto him. So why is it that we try to find every, from Micah's day until now, and it'll keep going until he comes? As I said, what a tragedy, that little spot on the map that houses some of, it's all, mostly all of the world's religions, not all, but most of them housed in a little speck of land. And even our devout Muslim friends that say they don't worship before anything, well, I'm sorry to tell you, that's not true. You've got that giant dome that's a sacred place that is highly venerated. There is no, it seems like no one looking at this and saying the displeasure of God to say, I don't want any of this. I want you to trust me even though you cannot see me. This was the trouble with the children of Israel. And for them, he performed miracles. He poured out signs and wonders. And it was never enough. And then he sends his only begotten son who does how many miracles? Just in the book of John alone, we see seven staggering miracles. And if you count his resurrection, eight. And it was never enough for people to say, like Thomas, eventually, my Lord, and my God, with, with the, the mindset of why didn't I see this before? What will it take for us in modern speak, not just reading from this and saying, oh, yeah, that's, a, that's chilling to see what will happen. What will it take for people in this day and age to let go of the erroneous baggage of the false worship of the things that are heralded as spiritual and religious? Do you realize that more, let's talk about the three or certainly the two major religions in, between Judaism and Christianity, and we are aware, we know what the book says, and yet even within this realm, we have people worshiping at things that they ought to not worship. I realize, for example, if you've ever been into a temple, to a Jewish temple, they'll bring out the Torah, and they're busy kissing the Torah, and they're, it's kissing the Word of God. I understand that, but even that, just think about that. Even that can become a certain type of veneration that is worshiping we are not biblolaters. I don't worship the Bible. I worship God's word. I'm not worshiping the pages. I take the words of God and put them into my heart, and that's what I'm worshiping. I'm not kissing my book. Sorry, uh, I don't know what's on those pages. I might need to, because <laughs> that book's been in a lot of places. But if you're still not sure when it says, I will execute vengeance, and you turn, to the New Testament, and you read something that's declared right there, not even in the book of Revelation. All you've got to do is read in, I believe it's in 2 Thessalonians. I'll find it for you and read it to you. In 2 Thessalonians, where it says, And you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his power. Very important. This is why you may hate what I'm going to say, but this is why every single time, if I should turn on the TV or if I should hear someone speaking on the, on the radio and they are not, I know they're trying to communicate some form of religion, but if they are not preaching the gospel, if they are not opening up this book, if they are not fulfilling, the Great Commission is not to go out and lasso people into the kingdom. He said, go ye out and make learners. That means we need to be in the pulpit, we need to be teaching, we need to be opening up, expositing, making clear even the things that are ambiguous and difficult to understand. It's the responsibility of every pastor to keep that commission. It's not the commission to go out and make people into something, oh, I want them to be the cookie cutter of me and they all have to come out as preachers. No. Every human that can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ should become a learner. And that means you put away your false worship. You put away the worship of idols. You put away bowing down at that statue or kissing you or whatever you have, your medallion around your neck that you think will bring you good luck. It's all superstition and you put your heart and your devotion to God. And remember, I read a passage out of 
Hosea very quickly where it says, I will heal their backslidings. God's very gracious. If people in this dispensation will turn back to him, he will forgive their backslidings. He will give them another chance. He will have mercy. We're still living in a dispensation of grace. God is not looking to cut down the nations just yet. He is not looking to pour out vengeance just yet. If you remember, quoting from Isaiah in Luke's gospel, when he says, the spirit of the Lord's upon me, and he goes on to say, and he stops right in mid-sentence and doesn't finish reading the quote of Isaiah because the rest of that quote is talking about the vengeance that will be poured out eventually. But until that time, we're living in a, in a dispensation of God's forgiveness, His mercy, His grace. This is what is so mind-boggling to me as a pastor. I do not understand this. I don't think I'll ever understand this. Why? When I hear people who have been commissioned or called to preach the gospel and they refuse to, they will not instruct people. More even than that is to warn people. It is one thing to say, I never knew to live in ignorance. Somebody who lives out in a far remote place where maybe the gospel, maybe they live a singular tribe of people who have never heard, and that could be forgiven if no one ever came and preached to them. But what do you do with a mass multitude of people, especially in this country, so spoiled, so full of, when we have seen great prosperity in this land, and yet people have turned their backs. If you want to know why this country is taking the slide that it is, I, I will keep saying this until somebody says, I get it. We have lost our religious moorings to God and, and this pseudo-religion. I hear people in the Christian faith, they are Christians in name only. They may come to church once or twice a year. They may or may not read their Bible. They have no, there's no relationship. There is no connection. Yet they expect because they've heard enough that when they die, they shall be with him. And that's like saying, you know, I want to be your best friend, but I don't really want to take the time to know you. Or I'd like to get married, but let's not ever talk. <laughs> I want you to be my husband or my wife, but I don't really want to have a relationship with you. So let's just pretend we'll exchange rings and we'll say we're married, but we're not. This is the same thing I'm talking about. You cannot, even... Some of my Jewish friends, I know I'm not trying to pick, I'm trying to point out, it may resonate with some of these people and they may wake up. Being pseudo something is actually nothing. Saying you are this in name only. Be ready to give a reason for why you believe. Why do you have faith? What is the purpose of you coming to the kingdom? If it is not what Christ said, we are lights that cannot be hidden, we are salt. Salt gives taste and it also preserves. We are designed to be this as Christians, not something that just comes out of the closet once a year to say Merry Christmas or whatever it is that's done. And how terrible those that have been enlightened, who have at least heard, who have at least some knowledge, and yet they decide it's not enough or, you know, I couldn't be bothered. Well, let me just tell you something. There's enough warning here in this book of Micah, for us even to take note. There's enough warning when he says, I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen. Don't think of the heathen as some people say, there's us and there's them. Think about those that are trusting him and every other nation, tongue, persons, I don't care what the color of your skin is, that have refused, that have been stout-hearted, that have said, not for me, no thank you. See how well that flies. And why did Christ spend so much time talking about this being cast into utter darkness? Why was that so important for him to talk about those who will be prepared, wise and foolish virgins? Those who will be prepared, those who will not be prepared. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should live in a perpetual realm of ah, like that. What I am suggesting is we live in perpetual faith and from faith to faith that each and every day with renewed faith, we wait upon him, we look for him, we anticipate. It may not be, as I said, many things must happen right now, historically, or they must unfold for a time to begin. What would commence, although we are in the last days, the time that's referred to as in that day, many things must happen. 
and they have not yet happened. So you could say, wow, I feel good it hasn't happened yet. I know what's going to happen, and I'm prepared for when it does, or minimally, I am preparing others around me. I talk to other people, not as a lunatic, not as I get ready, the end is coming. You know, you've all met those people that are, they're nutty. You have to admit they're nutty. But you give reason and back it up with substance. And underneath it all is your faith that says, God, in his wisdom, in his care, in his concern, he looked upon me. And you can say he looked upon me and he looked upon you with with grace or with pity or with disdain or with love, however you want to describe, however God looked upon his creation. It says in the book of Genesis he was grieved. I believe he's still grieved and probably more grieved than he's ever been to see how people treat his word and his only begotten son. But we who have listened, we who know, we can take hope and we can know this. God does have a plan for the future. And it sounds like a lot of doom and a lot of calamity, and yes, there will be that in the last days, in the end of time. But for those people who have trusted Christ and who look unto him, who is the author and finisher of faith, take courage, stay strong, and keep faithing. He will not leave us nor forsake us. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.